Good evening. It's good to see everyone back here again tonight. It looks like, uh, including with my own, it looks like most of our kids are dropping like flies. So I'm going to try to keep you adults awake. We'll see what happens. Uh, if we were a charismatic church, we might be doing calisthenics. But I'm just kidding. <laughs> No, we are going to be in the book of 1 Peter, and this is probably going to be the last lesson out of this particular book, uh, but we're going to be looking at uh, primarily 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 5 as our main text this evening. And so our, our subject matter is probably thought of as more of a well-deserved Sunday morning sermon, but I wanted to use tonight just to, uh, just to be a reminder for those that are here tonight uh, about uh, elders, uh, eldership, and the benefit of that uh, based on some of the things that Peter is saying here. So the title of the lesson tonight is Peter and the Need for Shepherds or the Need for Elders. And, you know, as as I was thinking about this lesson, I was thinking about leadership as a whole and how um, leadership is needed in all facets of life. Whenever you look at the family unit, obviously, even the way God set it up was for there to be a mother and a father and for the mother and the father to fulfill leadership roles uh, with their children. Uh, The Bible tells us, God tells us, Uh, that he needs someone to be the head of the whole family, and therefore he commissions the man to have that responsibility. And he expects a lot out of men in order to fulfill that role, but it also is set up as a joint effort to have a, a working and functional home for the man and the woman or the husband and wife to to work together in that sense. But also whenever you look Uh, Even in the business world and in humanity, there has to be a line of leadership. Someone has to be in charge of making specific decisions and things of that nature. Even in the animal world, there is a line of, if we want to use the word, authority. You know, we think about um, the, the... the uh, wolf kingdom and uh, like many other uh, animal groups and especially predatorial animal groups there's always the alpha right there's always this one particular one that is in charge and that will lead the rest of the group Uh, that particular alpha male as it's most often the case is responsible for getting the pack together and for searching out food. Essentially, the job of the Alpha is to make sure that the rest of the pack is constantly fed. And they are the ones that articulate the plan on how that's going to take place. Whenever you think about the Gorilla Kingdom, there's there's a particular one in charge of a a whole host of females. Obviously, uh, gorillas took their, uh, their idea of marriage from the Old Testament, right? But nonetheless, there, there's one that the rest of the group looks to, okay? And that's kind of a, a normal thing in the animal kingdom. The church situation, though, is a little bit different. While we do have our Alpha, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, we also have those who are in an earthly position that help lead the church, help shepherd the church, help lead the affairs of the church. And most of you here tonight know uh, who those two men are that serve as elders here. And so I want us to have just a better understanding among ourselves on on what that means and what that position entails because nowhere, especially in the New Testament, are we told that there is to be an alpha male, as it were, or an alpha that is in charge of an entire group. 
Whenever we look at how God set up leadership in the church on this earth, we see a host or a plurality of elders. And as a matter of fact, we're going to refer uh, to, to where we have some examples of that, just kind of by default, whenever we go to Acts chapter 20, where Paul addresses the Ephesian elders. It's an eldership. It is a group of elders that just reside within that one city. But he, in his goodbye to them, in his farewell, talks to them about what the expectations are for those particular gentlemen and the responsibilities that they hold. So I want to take a look, first of all, at 1 Peter chapter 5. And we'll read verses 1 through 5, and it is up on the screen if you can read that. So I exhort the elders among you. All right. From the very get-go, I want us to understand that first statement. See, the way that these letters work is, especially this one that Peter wrote, he probably had a particular, uh, he had a, a particular audience in mind. But this particular audience was spread over a few different places. Whenever you go to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, To those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And so he's talking about some of those being certain regions, some of those being particular towns or cities. But it seems that the language that Peter is using here would show that this letter is going to appear individually to each of these particular places. And as he's addressing these particular places, he's saying, I want to talk a little bit about the elders among you. So he's talking about this plurality, this group of men that oversees the affairs of each of these individual congregations. And that idea of among you is something that I want to stress in just a moment. That these were men that were taken from these individual congregations. They weren't from another city. They weren't from another town. They weren't, they weren't educated way, way far away and then brought in to be in charge of a group of people that they didn't know. These were men that became Christians in the city that they serve as elders, elders in. And so they knew the people. All right, continuing. I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You know, that's one of those passages that whenever you read the, the paragraph just right there in its context, it probably says more than enough. That's the sermon right there about Peter's desire for what the elders in these regions will do and what they will be. And that the attitude that these men are supposed to have. And as we look at this text, as we look at this passage and think more about this passage, I want to make three observations from it, although you could make more. First of all, what we need to understand about elders, what we need to understand about our eldership here, is that shepherds are and are supposed to be among the sheep. One thing that I think is extremely important 
And one thing I think that God meant to be the case here is that whenever you walk into this building, a visitor should have to ask, well, who are your elders? Now, why am I saying that and why am I in full agreement of that? I'm in full agreement of that, that that should be the case because there should be no physical distinction, save maybe a name tag or something, if that were the case. I know some churches do that. But there should be no distinction in dress, uh, in, uh, in appearance, anything of that nature that would set them apart or make them distinctive from the rest of the congregation. We are given no instruction or authority for that. And I think what a lot of churches or what a lot of religious groups have done is that they have taken the, uh, they've taken the instructions from the Old Testament, from the Old Law, and they've dressed up their church leaders like Old Testament priests to make them stand out, to make them look like they're in some sort of high position way above everyone else. But the first thing that we need to understand about our elders in, in an eldership is that elders are shepherds that are among the sheep. Now, I understand that whenever you look at a human shepherd and, and the example of animal sheep, that you're going to be able to tell the difference. But you know what? The job of a congregation is to do the work of the Lord, to get their hands dirty, to get in the mud, to, to get after it. And whenever I look at a shepherd herding sheep, they're not wearing these nice uh, eccentric robes or anything like that. They're wearing dirty, muddy clothes. They've gotten their hands dirty and they are among the sheep. They sheep, excuse me, they sleep. They sleep among the sheep. And they're there with them at all times. They're basically a, a part of one another. And so that's what I want us to understand whenever we think about our relationship with our elders. They're among us. We're among them. And, and Peter here is saying as much. That they are among one another. That they're an equal part, really, of the congregation. And so I want us to think about that and understand the emphasis of that. They were meant to be of the congregation. 1 Peter 5, 2, which we just read. He, is, he said, I want to address the shepherds among you. The shepherds who are among you, among the people. But I think... This idea of, of how we are to view shepherds or elders and, and how elders are to view their own status in a congregation can have a lot to do with uh, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3. Because what we do in a congregation, the positions that we hold in a congregation should never be a contest. It should never be, never be a rivalry. It should never be to see who gets to what position first. Folks, this is supposed to be a body of Christ. And that's how it's been set up from the beginning. Philippians 2 verse 3 says, Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. That is the job, and that's an instruction given to every member of the congregation, including leadership. Count others more important than yourselves. Sounds like a shepherd to me, doesn't it? That's what shepherds do. They count their sheep more important than themselves. Also, Elders, I believe they were not meant to be looked at with partiality. Now, I know that the Bible does tell us, and it tells us as much in, in the, the passage that Peter gave us here, about elders receiving a, a particular crown for their work. And I, I believe that's the case. But as far as time on this earth, 
as far as is one person more important than the other, we understand that God doesn't show any partiality in that realm. And I want us to think about John 13 and verse 16, actually, as we think about this. Here's Jesus saying, Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. We're, we're told in Romans 2 and verse 11 that God shows no partiality among people. But look, looking at John's passage here where Jesus is talking. You think about Jesus saying that. And then the authority in which Jesus' disciples looked at him. But what did he say? I didn't come here to be served. I came here to serve. And he taught them that much whenever he washed the disciples' feet and said, you go do likewise. You go do the same. And these were apostles that he was addressing in that sense. And folks, what do we know even in the corporate world and, and even in the world of business about the best leadership that's out there? I think most of you would agree that the best bosses that you ever had the best people that ever oversaw your work were the ones that probably served right alongside you, right? That although, yeah, they were in charge of you and they were in charge of other people, they looked at you as equals. And they looked at you with care and they cared about your work and your performance. And they knew that what you did or didn't do reflected upon them as well. And so they would kick in and do what they could to serve. You know, I saw an example of this the other night. You know, I don't want to hark on any kind of business or anything <laughs> in public per se. But y'all y'all probably go to restaurants in this area sometimes that are kind of hit or miss on whether or not it's going to be a good or a bad night of service, right? Sometimes they just kind of flop, don't they? And it's just like, oh man, we've picked a bad night to be here. And uh We've had a few of those instances when we go to Fazoli's. Sometimes when we go to Fazoli's, it's kind of a hit or miss thing. But something that I've noticed the last couple of times that we've been there is that they have a, they have a new manager in the back. And this guy, I don't know his name or anything, but I've been watching him every time. And he was on top of it. When something got behind or when one of his employees was struggling, he jumped in and he would fill the spot. And he would, he would ask, hey, you got this going, you got this going. He would make sure that, that uh, things were rolling all right, but he would also make sure that his employees were doing okay. And he was right there among them, getting the work done. He wasn't in some office somewhere, just bossing from back there. He was, he was in the battle, as it were. And he was serving right alongside his other employees. And when I saw that, I thought, you know, that's, that's an awesome example. That's an awesome example of what true leadership ought to be. You, you couldn't tell any partiality between him and the other employees. It was actually a beautiful thing to watch, a beautiful thing to see. Shepherds are among the sheep. Number two, shepherds are, or shepherds need to be willing overseers a shepherd or an elder needs to be in that position because they are willing to do so they understand their qualifications they understand the need for someone to fill that role and they do it with humbleness and humility yes but they also do it with the utmost pride and wanting to make sure that if they're going to be in that position, they're going to fulfill it the way that God wants them to. Shepherds are willing overseers. What does it mean to have oversight? 
Let's think about that for just a moment. What does it mean to have oversight? The word oversight and the Greek word that's used there means to look after or to beware. So obviously, whenever the the concept of overseer or shepherd was implemented for this church office of elder or eldership, God did it having in mind that the church was going to go through some pretty bad things from time to time. The church was going to encounter situations where there were going to be members that were tugged away by others. Did so with the full knowledge that there were going to be some wolves that would come in sometimes and try to take the sheep away. Some of those wolves would come in in sheep's clothing. And you know what? Sometimes the only ones that can tell the difference are the shepherds. Whenever you think about a real shepherd in a field, if a wolf were smart enough to dress up like a sheep, they'd probably get a lot of sheep that way. But they wouldn't be able to fool a shepherd because a shepherd knows his sheep. A shepherd knows his sheep and is, is wanting and willing and, and willing to go above and beyond to, to protect those sheep, to look after or to beware for them. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. This is where I was talking about where Paul is addressing and and giving a farewell to the the elders at Ephesus. Here's what he tells them as part of his goodbye. He says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to the flock. There's two things that they have to remember there. Pay attention to yourselves and pay attention to to the flock, all the flock, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Folks, that's, that's kind of the price that we're dealing with. You know, when Peter is addressing this idea of elders, he says, look, I want you to be willing to be overseers. You don't need to be in this position over compulsion. Somebody has compelled you to do it, begged you to do it. Are you willing to do it? Because here's the thing. Here's what's on the line. What is on the line is the very church that Jesus paid for in blood. And it's that way for each individual congregation of the Lord's church. He did so for the church universal. But he also did so for each individual congregation congregation of the Lord's church. It was paid for in blood. So he says, don't do this out of compulsion. You know, the thing is, that kind of brings us to this idea. What does it mean to have oversight? And I don't think you can have the correct oversight if you're not willing to be in that position. Why do they need to be willing? Why do elders need to be willing to serve? Because those who are compelled may not be ready to take on the task. Those who are compelled may run when the going gets tough. Those who are compelled may do whatever they can to avoid conflict, even if it comes to compromise. And so an elder needs to be willing to take on the task that is set before him. You know, when Paul, as I just mentioned a while ago, when Paul admonished these elders in Acts chapter 20, he he admonished them to be on the alert, to be ready, to be on the alert for, for some threats. That's going to come the way of the church. But you know what? Being on the alert requires passion, doesn't it? It requires passion for what you're doing. It requires really knowing and understanding what is at stake here. As I said a while ago, the blood-bought church of Jesus Christ. And you have to defend that. You have to protect that with the utmost 
of passion. Look at verse 35 of Acts chapter 20, if you will. Acts chapter 20, verse 35. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how He Himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. You know, within that, Peter's talking about some of the sacrifices that he had to make. Some of the sacrifices that he had to make for the church in and of itself. And he says, as elders, you have to give a lot. You have to give a lot. And are you willing to do that? What are you willing to give for the church? And he talks about helping the weak. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Elders need to be willing to step up. Step up and guard and protect and save in some of the most trying of times. Folks, we don't know we don't know what's in store for us. We don't know what's in store for the church in America in, in, in the future. I'm so glad in my lifetime, I'm glad to, to have the freedom that we've had uh, and the, the lack of threat that we've had to be able to come and worship. You know, I've, uh, I've been to a country or two where you went ahead and worshiped, but you didn't know if militia or, or uh, local law enforcement was going to bust in the door. Because they heard that you were a, a worshiping cult. We've never had that here. We face some fears. I know here in the last week there was talk on, you know, taking away tax exemption for churches and stuff like that. And I understand that's something to be upset about. and It's something to be a little bit scared of, but that's not going to take the church away. The church is going to continue no matter if we have to pay taxes or not, you know, even as a nonprofit organization but we don't know what's in store we don't know what our local government or, or national government is going to start implementing for churches and that's going to make it hard for Christians at times sometimes it's the it'll be the job of the elders to keep everybody together to keep everyone focused on the task at hand and on the mission that we all have and we all want to go to heaven. Elder needs to be willing in those situations. And I think also what this shows and what Jesus is, uh, the quote of Jesus here is, um, servanthood is more blessed to give than to receive. And that's why I come into the last point. Shepherds don't force, but lead. That passage in, in 1 Peter addresses that. Addresses that, that quite plainly. About not, not being someone that is overbearing, as it were. Not being someone that uh, thinks that they're just in charge of everyone. Not doing it for gain. Not, verse 3, not domineering over those in your charge. That's not what this biblical leadership is all about whatsoever. Elders don't force. They don't dominate, but they lead. And that's what we need to understand is that shepherds, shepherds are not lords. They don't have any special titles we don't call them your eminence we don't call them my lord and i say that i, I and, and it's it, it's kind of funny because i know some of you were brought up in in backgrounds where you called other men that that were in a religious position or a, a, a position of authority in religion but we were never given we were never given that instruction in the new testament Shepherds are not lords. You know, a lord is someone 
who has power and authority, but it's more so in the sense of a master or a ruler. And that was never, never the intent of Jesus. That was never, ever the intent of New Testament writers whenever they talked about an eldership, whenever they talked about church leadership. That was never, ever the intention there. But Matthew chapter 20, verses 26 through 28, another part where Jesus is talking to his disciples, I think is a great passage for us to think about when we think about the mind, the heart, the nature of, of what an elder should be. It shall not be among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, as we talked about a moment ago. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Shepherds are not lords. Shepherds are servants. And as I said in my illustration or my example a while ago with that manager at the restaurant. What a great example of servanthood and leadership. Getting right into it with his employees next to him. And folks, we're all of the same body. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ. And we're all commissioned to have the same mission for God. It's just that elders are, are also commissioned to make sure it's happening. Make sure that that stuff is happening. And making sure that the sheep are okay. In the process. Shepherds are servants. James 5. James 5 and verse 14. Here James says. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. And let them pray over him. Anointing him with oil. In the name of the Lord. See God has commissioned elders. To be supporters and guides. Supporters and guides. Both to those who might be in the congregation who are physically sick, but also whom are spiritually sick. Because if you go on in that passage, he talks about also it, for them to pray over that person for the forgiveness of sins. And those sins will be forgiven. It's one of the best ways that elders can serve the people of the congregation. It's to see to those and to meet the needs of those who are ill, but especially those who are ill spiritually. I think in our society, we have a hard time with that. We have a hard time maybe dis giving a distinction between somebody caring about us and then somebody just nitpicking us to death. But the thing is, is that the Bible has instructed elders to make sure that we are following the Bible. To make sure that we are a church that does care about doctrine, about what we are teaching, about what's being taught, about what we are learning here. Elders are supposed to be men that does care what you as a Christian and a member of the Huntingburg Church of Christ are doing in your personal life. Especially if that personal life is linking in, is leaking into public life. It matters to them, first of all, because they love you and they care about your soul. But it matters, second of all, because they love the church. Nobody wants a black spot on the name of the Huntingburg Church of Christ. That's why it's so important that we understand the burden that is behind that and what God has commissioned the eldership to do. And he says, verse 5, 1 Peter chapter 5, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to your elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. 
Sometimes we just need to humble ourselves. You know, we get so prideful sometimes whenever we do get called out about something. Whenever somebody does say, hey, look, um, I think you're getting involved in something here that you don't need to. I think you're being involved here in something that is, is not biblical. It's, it's going to hurt your faith. It's going to hurt your relationship with God. We don't like to be told that. But if you don't like to be told that, humble yourself a little bit. Step back and see if there is any truth to what's being said. And if it is, take care of it. That's what they want to help you do. That's exactly what they want to help you do. We need leaders among us that serve and protect both from the world and from ourselves. And I'm thankful for the elders that we do have. And tonight, I, I, I want us to also think about, though, as this congregation continues, as... Dennis and Dan won't be here forever. New elders are going to have to come along. And these are the kind of men that this congregation is, does, or is going to need. But we also need to make sure that we as a congregation respect that office, that we're not intimidated by that office. Because they are also among us. And they are a part of us. Now tonight, uh, this lesson was not necessarily a, an invitation warranting lesson. But we, we do want to offer the invitation to you this evening. And I hope it has kind of given you a grasp on, um, on the value of having elders. Uh, and let me kind of put this plug in. If you are struggling with something, if... if if you're hurting spiritually, if you think, if you feel like you've kind of gotten far from God and you're needing prayers, um, there's, there's nothing more magical about a, a preacher's prayer than anybody else in the congregation. But you know what? The Bible specifically tells us the value of the prayer of our elders. And so if you're struggling with something and, and, and you need prayers, grab one of them and, and pray with them. Uh, if, if you don't come forward, but we, we want you to come forward if, if you have the need to do that. If you're here tonight, too, if you're uh, not a child of God, I think most everybody here is. We want you to become a child of God. We want you to belong to the King. We want you to be fully a part of Christ's body here at Huntingburg. If you're willing to repent of your sins, confess the name of Jesus, and be baptized. You can do that. And we'd love to assist you with that. If you need to come for either reason, please come as we together stand and sing. Why keep Jesus waiting?